Good morning, Frederick Church of the Nazarene. No matter where you are today, we're glad that you can join us. And um, the good thing is God is not bound by position or geography or anything else. So let's praise him together today.
The opening scripture for this Sunday is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. The word of the Lord.
Good morning and God bless you. I'm looking forward to our time together today in God's word with great anticipation. The message today is from Jeremiah 18 verses 1 to 12 and it's simply titled Mold Me and Make Me. For those of you that have been around the church for years, you'll recognize this as a line from the old hymn titled Have Thine Own Way. Mold me and make me. As we work our way through the Bible in 2020, we land in Jeremiah, a book of prophecy. Jeremiah's career began with the initiative of God in chapter one and verse two. Jeremiah didn't go looking for a life as a prophet, but we learn early in the book that God set Jeremiah apart for service before he was even born. Jeremiah 1.5 tells us this. He came on the scene at a particularly difficult time in his nation's history. Jeremiah began prophesying in Judah halfway through the reign of Josiah, and Josiah reigned from 640 to 609 BC. And Jeremiah continued his prophecy throughout the reigns of five kings in all. It was a period of storm and stress when the doom of entire nations, including Judah itself, to whom Jeremiah ministered, was being sealed. Israel had been unfaithful, ungrateful, and refused to learn from history, we are told in chapter 2. Their sin was unrestrained and left them deeply stained as a people. Jeremiah 2, 20 to 25 tells us, Judgment is one of the all-pervasive themes in Jeremiah's writings, though he was careful to point out that repentance, if sincere, would change the course of the nation. Over and over again, God calls his people to repentance. And we see this first in chapter 3. God is quick to forgive when we repent. Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 tell us. For Jeremiah, God was ultimate. He was sovereign. He was ruler. He was God, capital G, God, Yahweh. The prophet's theology conceived of the Lord as the creator of all that exists, conceived as God is all powerful and as everywhere present. And you can find this in the 10th and the 51st and the 32nd and the 48th chapters of the book and the 23rd chapter. Jeremiah ascribed the most elevated attributes to God whom he served, viewing God as the Lord not only of Judah, but also of the nations. At the same time, God is, is very much concerned about individual people and their accountability to him. And our scripture for today is an allegory revealing God's intentions to redeem his people. So I would encourage you to pause right now and read through Jeremiah 18, 1 to 12. And as you progress through the week, would you read more of the book? And we'll probably preach again next week from Jeremiah. So pause and read Jeremiah 18, 1 to 12. The story is about the forming of useful pottery. And I have some pottery here that's meaningful to me. Uh, this is a handprint that Jacqueline made when she was little. And you can't see it, but her name is written across the bottom here. And uh, this sits on my dresser at home. It usually has coins and uh, loose ends on it, but it's a very meaningful piece to me. This piece of pottery was made by Dina Norris. Dina was a teen in our youth group who went on to ENC, and uh, she was told as a teenager that she wouldn't amount to much. But she went on to become a teacher and to care for children and to train children and raise them up. And Dina gave this to me after she had been in a pottery class when she was in high school in Glen Burnie High. Uh, in the early 90s, Chris and I traveled to Ecuador, and in Ecuador, we bought this piece of Peruvian pottery. Interestingly, the bottom, on the bottom, it is, it is inscribed that this was made in Piura. 
Peoria is a city which we visited and we did uh, work and witness in at building a church just a few years back. And so it's interesting that this was made in 93 and we purchased it in the early 90s. And here I have a piece of pottery from a town in which I would later serve. Uh, but this sits in our kitchen up on top of the cupboards and we just really liked it when we initially saw it. And this piece of pottery, uh, very typically Peruvian, uh, is cracked if you look closely. And uh, I actually dropped this piece of pottery on a sidewalk in Lima, Peru, after I had bought it from Chris when we, for Chris when we were down there on a trip and she was in the States with the kids. And I threw all the pieces, as many of the pieces as I could in a bag. You can see there are some that are missing and I put it back together and we display it in a cabinet where you would have to look closely to know that, uh, that it is broken. But you can see the work that has gone into some of these and you can see the level of, of uh, professional uh, work uh, in some of them and some of them just kind of people who were learning or people who were doing something special. Uh, most of us have some form of pottery around the house and Chris really likes pretty pottery and after our last trip to Peru I was instructed that I was not to bring any more back. Uh, we have quite a bit of Peruvian blue Peruvian pottery in our home. Well God instructed Jeremiah to go to the potter's house where he would receive a message from God. As he watched the potter at his work, Jeremiah became aware of the potter, the wheel, and the clay. The skillful hands of the potter were kneading the clay, and the prophet began to see the message God was conveying to him. Right before his eyes, an exquisite vessel came to take shape. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was, it was looking better and better the more that the hands of the potter worked over it and worked around it. But then suddenly, to Jeremiah's surprise, it was spoiled in the potter's hand. That's a quote from Jeremiah 18. It was spoiled in the potter's hand. The potter, without hesitation, saw something new and different and useful into which the spoiled clay could be formed. He made it, and I quote, as it seemed good for the potter to do. In other words, he molded it into something he saw fit to make. In verse 5, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again. God spoke to Jeremiah, and the message came clear and plain to his mind. God is the potter, Israel is the clay, and the wheel apparently represents the circumstances of life. All along, God has had a purpose for Israel. On the wheels of life, God has been working out his purpose for his chosen people. And might I say, all along, God has a purpose for you and for me, for us as the church, for us as his kingdom people. And on the wheels of life, God is working out his purpose for us, his people. But something in Israel has happened to spoil God's plan. God is saddened and pained over the impurity of the nation's life. And might I say, God is always saddened and pained when there is sin in our lives. Things cannot continue as they are. There is no other way except for the existing form of national life to be broken and refined and then reshaped into another vessel. And I'm so thankful that this is how God works in our lives. He, he refines and, and reshapes and takes what is broken and make, makes it as it is new again. The process of life is seen in the wheels. Every person and every nation is present and involved because God has a purpose for each of us individually and for nations. The object lesson teaches the sovereignty of God. God says, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does in verse 6? But it also teaches us of the free will of humanity. The response of the clay had thwarted the potter's purpose. 
We are free to respond to the dealings of God. If we respond positively to the touch of the master potter, his purpose is achieved in the formation of one who will fulfill and live out his plans. But if we push him back and respond negatively, God's work is marred and spoiled. If on the wheel of life we resist God's will, the breaking and remolding process follows. And this is never a pleasant moment or something that's easy for either the potter or the clay. Although there is an element of hope that another vessel will be formed, it does not relieve the demands of a judgment now. It's difficult to be reshaped by God, or one of the New Testament analogies is to be pruned by God. After refinement, there comes the moment of reshaping into another vessel, and I quote again, as it seemed good for the potter to do. These are verses one to six. G. Campbell Morgan sees this passage uh, in three points. He sees first the principles, the principles being the sovereignty of God and the freedom we have to surrender to God or the free will we have to either follow God or not follow him. He sees secondly, the purpose. God has a plan for us. He has a plan for you and a plan for me and a plan for us corporately. And he has bathed the universe in purpose. There's purpose in life if we will seek after God. And thirdly, G. Campbell Morgan speaks of the person. At the heart of the universe is a person, capital P. And we see him to be Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I'm thankful for God's principles, that he is sovereign and that he gives us free will, that he has a purpose for you and for me if we will follow after his will, and that in the person of Jesus Christ, we find redemption and salvation and forgiveness of sins that we might know fullness of life with God, salvation. We see the symbolism of the incident in verses one to six, the potter's clay and the wheel and the potter doing his work. We see what God intends for Jeremiah to learn from his field trip. And in verses 7 to 12, we find revealed to us God's methods with humanity. These verses teach us that God deals with us on a moral basis rather than a strictly legal one. God says, if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent. In other words, if Israel would repent, God would change the course of upcoming action. Since God operates on a moral basis, he can deal with us as we respond to him. This presupposes the, that we are not inanimate pieces of clay. We aren't uh, pottery, but we are persons with free will who are made in the image of God. This makes it possible for God to relent or change his mind. The King James Version, I believe, uses the word repent. God relents concerning proposed judgment, and instead of destroying men and nations, he forgives. If law alone had been God's method of operation, humanity would have been destroyed long ago. There would have been no divine revelation, no sacrifice for sin, no mediating priest, no prophets preaching repentance, no temple, and no prayers. If we were judged strictly by law, no one would survive. None would survive. God's grace, however, is greater than our rebellion and sin. We don't just survive, but we live victoriously because of the work of Christ in us. And might I just say hallelujah and praise the Lord. The people are told that it is only by reason of their stiff-necked persistency in wickedness that they are exposed to certain judgment. But, and, and this is a, a big turning point, a big transition, an opportunity for us to grasp a hold of God's grace and his forgiveness. But if they will return to their God, they will prevent ruin of the kingdom. 
Despite the author of God to spare the nation on the grounds of moral obedience, on the grounds of repentance, the people contemptuously reply to the threat of judgment. Here's their response. It's no use. We will continue with our own plans. We will all follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Wow, that's such a sad lesson or statement from people in God's word. And I say, let us not continue in our own plans. We will not follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. We will receive God's grace and mercy in this time of need. We will repent and find forgiveness and wholeness and fullness of life. But God's judgment of his people and the nations, though terrible, was not to be the last word, the final work of God in history. And once again, I say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Mercy and covenant faithfulness would triumph over wrath. Beyond the judgment would come restoration and renewal. Israel would be restored. God would make a new covenant with his people in which he would write his law on their hearts. If you'll see chapter 31 of Jeremiah and also Hebrew 8, he would write his law on their hearts and thus consecrate them to his service. God would make them holy or set apart for his service. And I'm so thankful that that judgment judgment doesn't have to rule in our lives. God's wrath doesn't have to rule in our lives because what he wants to do is restore and renew. He wants to bring the new covenant alive in our lives, to write his law on our hearts and to set us apart for his service to make us holy. The new covenant can, contains unconditional gracious and profoundly spiritual, moral, ethical, and relational promises. Spiritual promises that we can become new creations in Jesus Christ. Moral promises that he will change our behavior. Ethical promises that our mindset and our attitudes and our spirit will be in tune with the word of God, relational promises that we will not only live in right relationship to God, our father and Jesus, his son and the Holy Spirit who indwells us, but also live in right relationship with those around us. Oneness, peace and harmony, being repairers of broken walls and restorers of streets with dwellings. The house of David would rule God's people in righteousness through Jesus Christ and faithful priests would serve, especially our faithful high priest, Jesus the Messiah. God's commitment to Israel's redemption was as unfailing as the secure order of creation we see in chapter 33 of Jeremiah. God wants to redeem and his redemption and his love are unfailing. And so today, as we consider Jeremiah and specifically this 18th chapter of Jeremiah, what can we take away? I see, first of all, that God calls us to serve him. We are a chosen people and a royal priesthood. We are a people belonging to God. God calls us to serve. I see also that as we discussed on Wednesday, as we looked at the life and times of Joseph in Genesis, that even, and maybe especially, in the struggles, the difficulties, might I say the pandemics of life, God's purposes and plans are fulfilled through God's faithful people. If we will follow after him, we will live in fullness of life. I see, thirdly, that when God calls us to go, we should obey. For in obedience, we find revelation, direction, and truth. We see that sin, disobedience, and and a rebellious spirit spoil God's plan. 
But God doesn't discard us. He doesn't throw us away. Just as I didn't throw this away, there's still beauty in this piece of pottery, even though I dropped it and it broke. And God does a much better job than I could ever do in repairing that which is broken. God doesn't discard us when his plans are spoiled, but rather he reshapes us into the image of Christ. We see that God deals with us graciously, not legally, allowing for transformation and renewal to come in our lives. And finally, we see that mercy and covenant faithfulness triumph as Christ restores and makes us new. Mercy and grace and covenant faithfulness triumph because God is slow to anger and abounding in love. Yes, he will judge if we do not turn to him, but he holds forth new life for us through Christ who died to carry the weight of our sins and pay the debt for our sins and rose again to prove his power over sin and death and the grave and holds forth to us the hope of eternal life and the promise of eternal life and the promise of life to the full or abundant life right here and now. The principle is that God is sovereign and even in his sovereignty, he has given us free will. His purpose and plan for us can be known if we will seek him and, and seek his face and seek to know him and strive through the power of the Holy Spirit to follow after him. And the person of Jesus Christ brings transformation and change, brings beauty to our lives, beauty out of the ashes. And Israel, though rebellious, was promised that, that if they would turn to God, that he would hear them. We'll probably look at this next week in the preaching, that he would hear them and that he would heal them and that he would cause them to prosper. That doesn't mean to have all the money and things that they wanted, but to be a people who lived within the will of God, lived as people pleasing to God. And so might we be a people who say to God, mold me and make me, make me into something beautiful and useful and purposeful in your kingdom, I pray. Make me a person who helps others to see Christ, helps others to see the way, the truth, and the life, helps others to walk in the truth and the light. Make us your people that we might be honoring and pleasing to you, Father God, we pray. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your goodness to us, poured out to us in Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the new covenant, which is a covenant of hope and of grace and of peace and of salvation. And would you take us as clay in your hands today and mold us into the people you would have us to be, that your kingdom might come and your will might be done in and through us, your children, your church, your kingdom people, I pray. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and turn his face, his countenance towards you, and give you his peace, his shalom, his wellness and fullness of life. In these days, I pray in Jesus' name. Might I invite you to join us tonight on Zoom for moments with Dr. Jerry Porter, who is a missionary and uh, district and general superintendent emeritus, that you might receive the blessing of hearing what God is doing in his life and the life of his wife, Tony, and how God has used them across the years to bless and minister and to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. The, the information will be sent out via email 
And I, I just pray and trust that you will join us at six o'clock on Sunday evening for this uh, anointed and inspired time with Dr. Porter. The Lord bless you. Go in the strength of the Lord and may God mold you into the image of Christ, his son. Goodbye now. <laughs>